Didn't it, I didn't open it with my teeth this time. Yeah. Your teeth are not a tool. I was told that many times this week. Welcome to 1-2 Church. I'm Pastor Matt. Um, we are in a sermon series called The Process of Pain. Uh, if you're new here, I was... Am I a little hot? <laughs> that, came, that came off wrong. Like, like, Frankie, don't don't look, don't give me eye contact when I say that. But um, this was the first year that I felt God gave a word for the church in general. Uh, God has given me a word each year that I tend to live by. Intentional has been my word that's transferred for four years. This year, I felt God given us a word, and that's healing. And I didn't realize that God would put us in situations right away that we would need healing from. So um, I love how God works. That, that's my only response. Um, this process of pain, part four. Today I want to talk about cycles. Cycles of pain. Doing something that you know isn't healthy, it isn't beneficial, but you keep doing it over and over and over again. You, without raising your hand, I, I can guarantee that most people in this room know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, of doing something over and over and over and over again and looking in the mirror and saying, I hate this about myself. Why do I keep doing this? If, you're, if you have never experienced that, you're a robot, welcome here. For the rest of us, I'm going to speak to you. But this process of doing something over and over and over again, hoping you'll mature out of it, hoping you'll change, waking up the next morning and realizing, I just did that over and over again. And, and I'm going to share one thing with you. I'm not going to share everything about me, um, but one thing that I struggle with, and I hope that when I share it, I hope someone else struggles with the same thing because then I'll feel better about myself, okay? So let me know afterwards if you struggle with the same thing. But Luke 23, now I'm going to clarify as we get to this verse. I'm very particular about what translation that I use. I make sure that the translation that I use line, lines up with ancient history, ancient writings. People ask me all the time, hey, what's the best translation to read? And I, the, the, the one you read, the one you open. If you're in it, read it. So I'm very, I, I, I'm, I use passion and message sparingly because there is some liberties taken, um, storytelling. Sometimes the verses don't line up with what I need, but I want this for a purpose and it'll make sense at the end. It says the guards led away two criminals with Jesus to execute all three at the same time. When they came to the place that is known as the skull, the guards crucified Jesus, nailing him on the center cross between the two criminals. While they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and over, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The soldiers, after they crucified him, gambled over his clothing. So I'm going to talk today over the, the subject of over and over. And I want you to know that uh, most of you know the end of this story, right? One, one thief on one side mocks Jesus all the way to the end. The other one looks at him and says, will you remember me? In paradise, essentially revealing it, he was re, it was revealed in his heart that is God. This is wrong. I'm I'm going. I I I'm regretful. I'm remorseful. Could you remember me? But this is the spot. This 
this over and over cycles. One mocks, one receives. But I want to talk about the cycles of pain because wherever you are, there can be a cycle in your life that you can't break where you keep doing it over and over. It could be considered a habit where you don't like it. It causes you pain. Um, it causes you to maybe despise parts of yourself. And maybe it's a secret. Maybe it's obvious. And maybe it's a secret that you think, but it's obvious to other people around you that this is happening. So that's what we're speaking on. But have you ever been caught in a cycle of doing something over and over and over and you can't seem to break it? Now, I haven't always been this way, but I've been called an optimist. I've been called a faith guy. I've been called a Jesus guy. I've been called a person that's kind of a glass half full. But I want to go on record today that I believe in a God that is so real, so loving, so big, so personally involved in your life. I have to believe that in the next few minutes that this cycle, that, that when I said the, the habit that you're going over and over, I know that there's some people in here that immediately went to, yep, God just put something on my heart of something I keep doing over and over and I can't seem to break it. But I believe in a God that is so, so big that in the next few minutes, you can begin to break this in your life. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm going to shoot for the best because I believe God can do anything. So why can't we believe that focusing on this God, that the cycle can, can, can begin to break in your life? So can we start there? Let's talk about a God that is so big that this cycle that you think you're stuck in can begin to maybe chip away at that cycle. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the words that that you will give me. Shut my mouth to anything that is not of you. And as we move forward, Lord, I pray that anything that we keep doing over and over that doesn't glorify you that today is the day that you are so big so powerful that we can gain hope from freedom with it in jesus name amen so something i've struggled with in life this cycle that i couldn't seem to break and i can be honest with you i'm getting better at it And you may, when I say this, you may be like, that's not the person I know, but that's the person my wife knows. That's the person my daughter knows. The thing that I struggle with and the cycle and it manifests itself, the thing that I struggle with is anger. Anger. Now, it comes to, when it comes to competition, that's when I get angry. When I'm playing card games or fast track with my friends and I lose, that night, ruin for me. Anger just bubbling up of if I just would have made one more move, I could have won that game. Now, we canceled NFL ticket this year. Why? Because every time the Seahawks lost, the Sunday was ruined. It was, and they they lost a lot. So I said, I'm going to cancel it because I want to break this cycle of being angry over and over and over again. But there is one instance in my life where I realized I can't continue going down this path, so I'm going to step away from something that caused me anger. And that was coaching. I was a coach for a long time for basketball. Now, if you know me and you've seen me um, in that situation, I know there's some people watching online. They have. I believe that there should be two perfect people in my life. One is Jesus and the second are referees. That's it. That's, uh, That's two people that need to be perfect in my life. And when they make a mistake, I have to let them know. And so while I was coaching, I would let them know every single mistake. And that started from junior high 
to high school getting technicals, throwing out, throwing out of games, to coaching, to all of a sudden becoming a pastor, and then coaching, and then people sitting next to my wife, and they're like, isn't that the pastor? And she's like, I have no idea who that is. He might be an atheist. He's probably an atheist. I don't, I don't think he believes. I'm, I'm not sure. One game in California, I'm, I'm coaching fifth graders. And I have them, I have them in this huddle. And I don't, I don't get angry at my players, which is weird. I don't get mad at them. I get mad at the guys in stripes. And I'm in the huddle, and we're in, on the court in this huddle. And all of a sudden, my seven-year-old daughter walks in the middle of the huddle, in the middle of a game. Taller players, I'm up there. She's just so little. She looks up at me, and I look down, and she said, Hey, Dad, Mom wants me to know that if you don't stop, she's leaving. <laughs> and then she left the huddle. And not even a quarter later, I got a technical foul. <laughs> and I had to find my own ride home. <laughs> but this cycle of anger, I don't know if any of you go through that, or maybe right now you're thinking of a cycle you're going through, but I know what cycles feel like. I've done self-talk. I try to talk to God every day. I do. I, I try to talk to him. I, I will get angry at the people closest to me, which is usually myself. So the anger bubbles up. And then have you, ever, have you ever gotten angry because you're angry? Is it just me? Where you, you get angry and then all of a sudden you're angry because you're angry. And then you just keep going over and over and over in this cycle. And I thought, I was like, maybe I'll just mature out of this. Now, I quit coaching because ministry and Matt in coaching didn't mesh well at all. There's no, hey, in these two hours, grace is off the table. No, it doesn't work with me. So I removed myself from coaching. I loved coaching. Couldn't control. If, if, if someone made a mistake, I had to let them know. And these cycles that I would go through. But then I thought, is this getting worse? And this cycle that maybe you're thinking about right now, maybe you're in that spot of, is this getting worse? It can be as, it can be something as like internal thoughts that you can't break about yourself. It could be something that you eat. It could be a bottle that you drink. It could be something that you say. It could be something that you do. So many layers to the cycle and we keep doing it over and over and over and we str we we're trying to start doing something to break this over and over and thinking I have to break this cycle. Anyone been there? I I I I've been there. Where here's if you if you say you haven't, I want to give you some signs. Here here's one of the telling signs that you are currently in a position of a cycle that that is unhealthy. Maybe I go as far as sin. now sin. Now the Bible, the Bible talks about sin. It's missing the mark, not set by religious leaders, not not set by ancient leaders, but a mark set by God. The the telling sign that you are in a cycle that you can't break, where it's over and over. A telling sign is you go fault finding. It's the classic human condition, and it's called projecting. You project on others. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like parts of me. I don't, I don't like what, uh, what's eating away at me. It's frustrating. I don't like it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to go find people with sin. But it's true. Very, very critical. It's a very telling sign. Now, I'm not saying that 
we're, we're critical always because we're in a cycle we can't break. But fault finding and projecting is one of the telling signs that you're in something, there's something about you that you don't like, but you can't seem to change it over and over. This over and over occurrence. Now, let's choose, let's choose gossip. Let's say you hate gossip, but you love doing it, and you're in a cycle over and over of gossip. So, you find someone that likes to gossip a lot, and you go to somebody else, and you tell them, man, this person... I'm telling you, this isn't gossip. I'm just telling you about this person. They love to gossip, and it's over and over, and they, they, they're just doing this. Uh, I, what, and you don't like that part of you, so you find someone else that does it. You go find other people, and you tell them the same thing that, they, that you're complaining about. And you should have friends in your life that's, that say, you know what, that's really funny coming from you. And then you'll be like, well, well no, no, I, I do a little of it, but they do so much more of it. And what the friend should say is, you're projecting. You're projecting. Preachers, for instance, and any preachers watching online, I'm about to pull back the curtain. Preachers, preachers, for instance, are the most hard and the most brutal on areas of weaknesses and sin that they struggle with. That's the classic preacher giveaway. If he or she is just hammering one particular sin over and over and over again, you should sit back and say, hey, yo, preacher, you, you, go, you okay? Are you, you good? Because you keep going over and over. This happens a lot. This happens a lot. It's... it's our cycle and it's not always 100 percent true but it exists but how bizarre is this we have a criminal next to jesus hanging on a cross convicted for crimes that evidently were so were so sure and so obvious he's being executed for them and while he's dying he's fault finding He's in so much pain, he's in this cycle, that he starts to fault find. This is the human condition at the extreme. He's dying and he's saying, really, you're God? You're God? You're saying you're God. Why, why can't you save us and save yourself? With his last breath, he wants to find at least one other person that's the same off or worse than him. You know, I, I, I'm, I know I'm a thief, but you're sitting here saying, you're God? Why don't you save us? And I'm thinking, Mr. Thief, you, you, don't, you don't like yourself very much. One account says they were robbers. They were thieves. Not just one time. These were professional thieves. One too many times. They were so counterproductive they were hurting society that they said, we are going to execute you. Talk about a cycle they couldn't even break after getting caught multiple times. It wasn't a one time I, I stole something and now we're going to nail you. No, this was an over and over thing. Now they're getting their just reward and he starts to project on the person next to him. What's interesting in Matthew, let's look at Matthew. Matthew and Mark, Luke, John, the Synoptic Gospels. Here's what Matthew says. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Do you see this last verse? In the same way, the rebels, plural, who were crucified with him, also heaped insults on him. 
Now let's look at Mark. Mark says, in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He's, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. This blew me away because as I was taught at a young age, there were two thieves, one believed, one didn't. Matthew and Mark want to let us know that at the beginning, both, both projected on Jesus. Both of them. And it's important for us to know that at one point, it says he hung there for, for hours, suffocating in his own blood. But apparently the first part of that, of him suffocating in his own blood, nailed on the cross, both, both criminals are hurling insults on Jesus. Both are projecting. You think you're God? Why don't you save yourself? All in, in all of their pain, that was doing something for them. Now that's where, what we have to own here. Our projecting, our fault finding does something for us. Let's, let's be open and honest. It does something for us. But it is, is as cheap as can be. We've talked about this before. Cheap connections where you have to do it over and over again to get the satisfaction that it, that it brought the first time. But it, it is cheap and it is a vapor, and it escapes. So you have to keep doing it over and over again. They can't break it. So we project. We find fault in other people. The pain gets worse, so the projection gets worse, and it gets deeper and darker. And all of a sudden, we, we, we end up in what they call rock bottom, and we can't keep friends. And now I don't really like the person that I see in the mirror and I can't break this cycle. And it gets real. It gets so real that you can be getting executed for crimes on society and still, with your last breath, project on the man that is innocent. Now, this isn't a contradiction. Matthew, Matthew and Mark aren't con contradicting Luke. They're adding to it. They're showing their point of view from this. It's telling us that at one time, both criminals. Am I the only one that thought it was just one criminal? And then I read this and I'm like, so both were projecting, both were fault finding. And my favorite part is Jesus said nothing. He just hung there. And it just wasn't one insult. It says they were hurling insults, plural. Jesus, true to form, only thing they would have heard him say was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Now Dr. Luke comes along, and let's go to Luke. We'll go to a different version, and I want to read this whole story to you. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Okay, hold on, hold on a second. There's a change. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished, punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Is there more to that? There we go. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So I love Dr. Luke because he goes into this more detailed account and wants us to know that at one point, one of the criminals changed. And I'm thinking, what? Completely changed. Now that gets me interested. These guys are in cycles so bad that they have to be removed 
from the earth. And you mean to tell me that at that time, at one of those, uh, at one moment, one of those criminals changed his tune. tune. If you were at the cross and the middle man claimed to be innocent and he was dying the same horrible death as two common thugs, it would be hard, wouldn't it, to believe that that man dying the same way you are was the creator of the universe. And yet, one criminal changes, breaks the cycle. Luke says, and we don't know the timeline, timeline one criminal saw something. What was it? Was it something that he heard? Was it the silence of the man on the middle cross? What is it? Was it his demeanor? Was it his calmness? Was it his countenance? Was it his peace? Was it his love? What was it that changed this man's cycle? Because he's in this classic cycle. That, that man, people believe, we, we believe that cycles can't be broken, that we can just suppress them and try to stop them. And it's like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. It doesn't work for very long. So we try to do everything we can, and we do the best we can, and we blame family history, and we say it is what it is. Just hold it down. But you can't really break the cycle, can you? If it's in you, you can't really break the cycle. And I would like to suggest that there remains a Jesus who is now not dead, but he rose again. He appeared to, to many, levitated into the clouds, and the Bible declares that he sits in the heavens and laughs at those that oppose him. He is God, and if one of those criminals can change their cycle, then maybe I can change my cycle. And maybe you can change your cycle. What did he see? What did that thief see? I read this and I say, I need to see what that man saw. I need to see what did you witness that was so compelling? It gets deeper, church. We just talked about other people that mocked him. The onlookers, the, the, the soldiers, those who berated Jesus, the, the bystanders, all of them who mocked him. The earth goes dark, the ground shakes, rocks break open, and the people went home, and the Bible declares that the people were beating their chest out of grief for they knew something had been done wrong. All of them knew something was wrong. Now, up until the 19th century, this is gruesome, it's horrible. Up until the 19th century, executions was one of the most enjoyable forms of entertainment on the planet. Now, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to insult you, but there was no technology back then. But the most entertaining things to do, that's why the cross was near a road, down the hill a little bit, so people could come. It was horrific. It was gory. But to watch a Roman crucifixion was one of the a, a rare forms of entertainment where they would go to, go to mock. They would go to scoff. They would go to throw insults. And, and their kids were brought to the site. They came for the entertainment. And after this happened, they leave saying, something was not right today. Something was not right. What, what did they witness? What did that thief see? I'm going to go a step further. This man, the other criminal, sees something so compelling that it, it eclipses the excruciating pain his body is going through. The, the pain he is going through personally. It eclipses that. Because I'll be honest, if you execute me publicly, 
I'm probably not going to be focused on the man next to me or even be concerned about what he's going through if I have nails through my hands and my feet. I'm not going to be concerned about anyone else about the, except for the pain that I'm in. Now, this may be TMI, but I had an ingrown hair on my back. And Crystal, I don't know why she gets pleasure out of this. She's like, ooh, ooh, let me take care of that. I love doing that. Now, there's people that love doing that. Find it, I find it horrible, and I find it gross and painful, and I don't know why you would want to do this. But she tried, and I yelled out in pain, and she said, Matt, stop. You're, you, really? Are you kidding me? Like, you're really over-exaggerating. I'm like, no, this is so painful. And she goes, I haven't even got it yet. And I said, there's more coming? And so there's, there was a moment where there was another. And hand to God, I was yelling and focused strictly on the, my pain in my body. But the moment you go into pain, you're not really thinking about anyone else, are you? This man is dying, and something caught his attention that is so powerful. And this is what gets me. Ooh, this is good. Jesus can be so compelling that you can be in the most pain you've ever been in your life. But he is so wonderful, so loving, so forgiving, so powerful that he can actually draw your attention away from your pain. Now that's real. This man is so caught up, he changes his tune. And the other criminal keeps hurling insults and says, hey, the, the guy finally tells him, hey, don't you fear God? You don't get this. We're about to die. Now, you have to understand something about crucifixion. Death happens by your lungs filling with blood, and you die by suffocation. Talking is the most painful thing you can do during this, where you have to lift on the nails that are holding you to that board. You have to push up to gain a breath to speak any words. And Jesus speaks seven statements, which tells me about his strength that he had on that cross in that pain. But every word is precious. And this man is so overwhelmed with what he's seen, he causes extra pain, extra pain in his body to say, hey, don't you fear God? We're about to die. We deserve this. This man has done nothing wrong. And I want to say, how do you know that, thief? How do, how do you know that? And I can tell. I can see it. These hours next to him, I feel it. There's something. He has done nothing wrong. And you know what, church? That's one of the hardest things for people to believe today when I tell them about Jesus, that I follow a God named Jesus that for 33 years never did anything wrong. This man, what he's seen, he is so compelled to declare that the man of the same execution has done nothing wrong. What did he see? What did he hear? Because the first time, he's, he's mocking him. But he speaks now to a man that he believes to be God. Now, can we go back one slide where it says, remember me? Just one slide. I love this, church. I love this so much. This is almost like a plea. He's like, could you? Would you? Like, if, I know I've, I've, know I've lived a life of this, but please, if you could, if you just would, could you remember me when you come? I love when he says, remember me, because what the thief doesn't yet understand is God can never forget you. Remember you? Oh, sweet child, I can't ever forget you. 
and you're asking me to remember you, I can't forget you. Now, we used to take Michaela to the playground, and, you know, other kids watching them, when they would do a face plant, I would feel bad. I would. There, there's times that my initial reaction is laughter. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I know it's not the pastorly thing, but when they fall, I'm like, oh, man, that looked like... And then you go, and you're like, oh, you do the pastor thing of... Hey, are you okay? I feel bad. I'm sorry, little buddy. Come on, I'll help you up. God bless you. But it's not my kid. But when it's, when it's my kid, you probably think I freak out. I do. And you don't think it's weird that I act like that. Because that's mine. That's my baby girl. My baby girl does a face plant, and I'm like, oh, oh, sweet baby Jesus, please, everybody, join me in prayer. Everyone gather around. Join us in prayer. We, we, need, we need a prayer of healing. Let's pray, because that's mine. That's mine. And what we fail to understand is you are his. You are his. My, uh, my friend this week... He looked at me and he said, thank you for not turning your back on me. And church, there are many reasons that I could have. And, there were, and if I'm honest, there are many reasons that I wanted to. But I paused and I looked at him and I said, you're God's son. I can't turn my back on you. That's like turning my back on my family. I can't, I can't do that. When, when did we get to thinking that we could just start walking away from people? That we, that's God's child. And what the thief fails to understand, because he thinks that God loves like, like humans do, where it's performance-based, but he's saying, is there, is there a chance? Is there a chance that you get where you're going because you're the one? You're the one. I know it. Would you? Would you remember my name? I'm thinking, your name? I remember everything about you. You're mine. You're my son. And he said something so beautiful. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. And I'm like, whoa. Whoa. Everything changed. And I think of this man and think, Man, if only, if only he could have seen Jesus earlier, right? Before he's about to die, if only he could have seen him earlier. And this is part of that message that no matter where, where you're at in life, Jesus is there. But what if you could see Jesus right now in your pain? The pain that you're going through, no matter what, what length or the excruciation or the thing you look at in the mirror and say, I hate that about myself. What if you could see Jesus the way the thief saw Jesus? Now, can we go back to the very first verse? The one we started with. While they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and over. And this is where we get into it, okay? Here's where we get into it. There, there, there's a, a lot of thinkers, a lot of scholars and writers who look at the original language and the writings that was passed down that are not sure that if this prayer in its tense was plural or singular. Many wrote it over and over. Some wrote it as one time. It's been a debate over many of years. That is, did Jesus keep praying this prayer over and over, or did he say it once? That's why I included this version. Because I believe, this is just me, I believe based on the research I've done, the scholars I've talked to, the pastor team that I have around me, I believe this is the likely scenario. That it was said more than once. And we can debate, but that's my thought on reading this. Now, I also have to give you the flip side. There's a few scholars that debate whether he even said this or not. Now, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe that's true because you want some chills? 
One of the prayers that became famous among Christian martyrs was this prayer. You remember Stephen when he was being stoned? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And throughout history, this prayer was famous among Christian martyrs. When they're being executed for following Jesus, this was their ultimate act of their prayer to God, of Father, don't hold this against them. Even after that, that's why I believe that this is truth. They would pray this ultimate prayer over the enemies who were killing them for following Jesus. Don't hold this against them. So I believe Jesus said that prayer. But what if, what if he prayed it over and over? What if? Let's think about this. What if he prayed it over and over? Now my brain says, I keep screwing up over and over. Maybe you can't relate, but I need a God that forgives me over and over and over. It only makes sense that the God I have put my entire belief system is the God while enemies nailed him to a tree that he created. He prays over and over, Father, forgive them. Abba, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Were there criminals nailed next to him that thought initially were just ramblings of a madman? Did hours pass and, and, they, and one start to realize, man, this is like no other man that, that, that I've ever, that's ever lived, that I've ever seen. But I'm going to close with Romans. Let's go to Romans 8.27 for those following online. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Do you see this Plurality, pleads, pleads, plural, plural. Now, I don't know how this works, but I want you to see this because I believe this is what could break the cycle that you are in because I need a a forgiveness that goes over and over if I'm in a cycle that is going over and over. And the Bible says the Spirit of Jesus is in heaven as we speak, and He prays over and over. Do you know what He prays? Forgive them. Forgive them. The Father says, I will. The Son says, it's finished. And the Spirit says, I will continue to pray for you, walk with you. Forgive them. Forgive them. And it's never stopped over and over and over. And you may say to me, Matt, there's this person in my life. He'll never break the cycle. They'll never break the cycle. They have to hate it. They have to hate their cycle in order for it to be broken. And I'm afraid we've moved from hating our air, hating our sin, hating our wrong, hating our cycle, and we've turned it into hating ourselves. And we are starting to project it, and we start to hate hate other people, and it's not helping. But what if the Bible was true? What if this was true? What if it was the goodness and long-suffering of God that broke the cycle in our life? Was it, I want to ask you this question. Was it a condemning God that broke the cycle of this professional crook that was being executed? Was Jesus up on the cross looking at the thief saying, you must hate your sin, you must turn, you're wrong, you're bad, this isn't good. Was that the words from the cross? Or was he praying over and over and then silently not defending himself taking upon himself the insults while he took upon the sins of all of humanity and those who insulted him? Was it not love that seemed to ooze out of the the pores of his body? Was the thief converted by what he witnessed? Because it was love. It was forgiveness. It was the goodness of God that woke this man up. Why didn't the other man see it? I don't have the answers to that, church. But for one, everything changed. And I wonder if we can start to talk directly to God every day where we can see this Jesus. Am I, 
Am I the only one that has fleeting moments of, man, this seems ridiculous. I'm praying, but I feel like I'm just talking to myself. Am I the only one of just, I, I, this is ridiculous. I, I, God, help me with my day. Remember me. I hope you still loves me. I hope you still love me. Seems ridiculous sometimes, I bet. Seems just as ridiculous as praying to a man dying the same way you are. Remember me. Remember me. This doesn't make sense, but I see what I see. You were love. Will you remember me? And I love Jesus. He says, today you'll be with me. I wonder if we can allow the world to see this man. Not our traditions. Not our rhetoric. Not our religion. Not our rules. Not our projection on people. But the one who takes on the, the sins of the world. Behold him. I had a conversation with a friend recently that says, I don't believe in God anymore. And I said, but you would love Jesus. You just got, you just got lost in the mix. You just got lost in the things that church people do. You just got lost in the religion. You just got lost in the rules and this cycle. You would love Jesus. You would love Jesus. We have to get past some of this. And if nothing else, I could say, you're right. I struggle with anger. This sucks. It's the cycle I'm going through. Or, 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 this cycle is the thing that helps me see the only person that can help me break it. Where this cycle brings me to the end of myself and I, and I say, God, you, God, I tried everything. I need to see what the thief saw. I know I too am broken. I, I can't save myself, God. I need to hear you pray over and over. Father, forgive them because it could change everything. And I can't explain what I felt during worship this morning, church. I can't explain it. Thank you, Nate and Sarah. I can't explain it, but I just so I sat over on the side and, and I just started crying because I just felt the love of God, and I said, whoa, this is everything. This is what changed my life. It's not rhetoric. It's not traditions. It's not religion. It's not rules. It's not principles or concepts. I felt Jesus. And the only way I could describe it, it was sitting over there was, it was like liquid love pouring over my body. And I was like, thank you. A love of Jesus that knows no ends, where it's unconditional. But I want to remind you, you are his son. You are his daughter. And when he, you fail, he jumps to your side. He can't help it. He can't help it. He loves you so much. He is your father. You are his child. I need more of that love to break the cycles in my life. I need more of that, uh, that, that love that breaks the pain that's happening in my life. And it's only one thing. It's Jesus over and over and over. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I pray, Lord, as we, we relish in this just love that is being lavished upon us. And I can just feel in this room that there's some people that are experiencing this that they may not even know what is happening, but it is your love just pouring over them over and over. And Father, I pray that these cycles that we get caught in that cause pain in ourselves and pain in others, that we realize that we can't suppress it. We can't do self-talk. We can't set up five rules to be able to break it, that we look to you. We look at your demeanor on the cross. We look at the statements on the cross. And now we can look at the spirit that lives within us that you have granted us. That that's what will break the cycle that so many are struggling with. Father, we thank you for this, this love that is lavished upon us. And for those listening with eyes closed, the Bible says that if 
you call on his name, if you say yes to him, if you look to him and say, will you remember me? That I don't have it all together. I just want 